Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed for agreeing to see me here in London. Good to see you. It's been uh, 10 years. It has been 10 years since 10 I came years. to Jerusalem, yeah. Well, a lot of things have happened. A lot has changed. A lot has changed. Not least where I'm working. <laughs> um, well, I'm still working in this yeah, case. Exactly. <laughs> um, Prime Minister, you've been elected six times. You're the longest serving Prime Minister in Israel's history, 15 years. Israel is 75 in a few weeks' time. And it ought to be a time, a celebration both for you, for this extraordinary personal achievement, and for your country. But instead, Israel is in turmoil at the moment, facing what some fear could turn out to be civil war, oh God. fears of a potential third intifada. Is this your biggest challenge right now? It's a very big challenge, but I, I think that the prospects for Israel are great. I think there is a, a lot of concern about the democratic judicial reform that we want to move ahead with, but people think that it's going to, uh, uh, to result in a, in a fissure that I don't think will last, because people will see at the end that Israel was a democracy, is a democracy, and will be even a stronger democracy after this democratic reform. So I think, uh, I think you're right, there's a lot of tension right now. I, you know, I wish it wasn't so, but uh, I'm, I'm quite confident that we'll get over this, uh, this difficulty because, you know, you have to reform things that get ossified. And in Israel, what we've had is uh, the ossification of the, 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 the imbalance between the three branches of government that has to be corrected. This happened in the last 20 years. It's been building up, building up, building up, and people say, we want to correct that. And, you know, people who are used to one thing don't want to correct it. So well, quickly. that's because the, the critics say it's not reform, it's regime change, effectively, is what you're trying to push through. They say that what this bill will do, it'll arm you, the Prime Minister, with the power to appoint judges that you want, and for your government to overturn any judgment of the Supreme Court that you don't like, as long as there's even a one-vote majority in the Knesset. In other words, the judiciary, they say, will be neutered, and with that, the rule of law, and with that, democracy itself. Yeah, well, let, let, let's take that apart, one by one. The first thing that, that has to be understood is what is a democracy? Democracy is majority rule with the protection of individual rights. And to get these two things, what you have is uh, the checks and balances between the three branches of government, the uh, legislative, the executive, and the judicial. Everybody understands that. In Israel, over the last 20 years, that balance has been uh, taken off the rails because the judiciary became not independent, it's always been independent, will always be independent. It became all-powerful. So it can nullify any decision of the parliament, the Knesset, and it, it can be a legal decision, a, a legal uh, uh, law, that's fine, but they say it's not reasonable. It doesn't exist anywhere in the democracy, such powers. It can nullify any decision of the government, and often has. It can nullify any appointment of the government. It can intervene in military matters, it can intervene in our battle against terrorists, it can intervene uh, in taking gas out of the sea that costs us billions of dollars, billions of dollars. I finally got it out. Uh, all these things are unacceptable. But it's called, well, hang on, it's called checks and balances. Well, there is no checks and, and balances. It's, but the only, well, actually, it's the only check and balance in Israel to the government. No, right? no, it's not. In, in all democracies, there, there's one other thing, and I'll, get, I'll, I'll answer your question one by one, it's important. Uh, there is one other thing that characterizes this, uh, the, the, the judiciary in Israel, and that is that the judges veto the appointment of judges. They effectively select themselves. In other words, th and that doesn't exist in any democracy. The reform that we're dealing with right now corrects that. It allows for a balanced... What well, it means that you can pick them. No, no, I can't pick them. In fact, it's, it's, it's an even thing between the majority and the minority, the coalition and the opposition. Uh, it's, in, in fact, not that one side can pick them, but by the way, in most democracies, with the exception of Britain, by the way, they all, all uh, judges are chosen by elected officials. And in Israel, the discussion is so uh, narrow and so one-sided that they say, how could it be that judges will be chosen by elected officials? And I say, hello? This is what is being done in every democracy. But why, why is someone like you, who's always been such a staunch defender of an independent judiciary in Israel. Why take a move that even some of your close colleagues and supporters say is a step too far in infringing on that independence? I, would, I absolutely will always defend the independence of the judiciary. And the way that's achieved in all the democracies who are in which judges are appointed by elected officials. In America, for example, uh, who picks the judges? 
politicians, the president. The politicians then have to affirm. By the way, that's replicated more or less in most of the democracies in one way or the other. Well, how, do, how are the judges independent? They're independent because once they're there, they're there either until retirement or until life. And that's what happened in the United States just now. I mean, the former president chose some very strong <laughs> conservative judges, and the first opportunity, they voted against them because they're independent. So the independence of the judiciary will always be maintained. Uh, I think that the important thing to but understand... But that's not, that's not how people are seeing this. That because they don't know the facts. Well, they studied the bill, and they no, say they that they're, they're, pre people. they're presenting it as, as a, an autocratic move. No, they're, well, they're, they're framing it as such, but they haven't really studied the But bill. is what you're doing really consistent with what you said in 2012 yes, in yes. this speech? Let me remind you yeah. your exact words then. Mm -hmm. I believe that a strong independent court allows for the existence of all other institutions in a democracy. I ask that you show me one dictatorship one undemocratic society where a strong independent court system exists. There's no such thing. In places with no strong and independent court system, rights cannot be protected. In fact, the difference between countries in which rights are only on paper and those in which there are actual rights, that difference is a strong independent court. This is the reason that I am doing and will continue to do everything I can to protect the court system and make it strong and independent. I will continue to operate this way every time a bill comes across my desk that could harm the independence of Israeli courts will take it off the table. That's you, 2012. That's, that's and now here you are, 11 years later, you're the one putting the bill on the no. table, which many people on all sides of the divide in, in Israel say is achieving the exact thing you were so keen to avoid. I stand by everything that I said. An independent court, an, uh, a judiciary that is independent is something that was in Israel and will remain in Israel. But here's the thing, in the last 10 years, the judiciary went from being an independent judiciary to an all-powerful judiciary. The balance of three, the three branches of government says that you have to have three branches that are balanced. In Israel, you have like one big trunk, the judiciary, that's what's developed, with two little twigs on the side. That's not democracy. Democracy means that every, every branch of government balances the other. And that's, in Israel, it's the most judicially activist court on the planet. But people would rather in Israel, it seems, mm -hmm. judging by these mass protests, hundreds of thousands of people out on the streets protesting every weekend now for nearly three months. You've got generals, scholars, entrepreneurs, former heads of Mossad. Some of your closest political allies have come out and attacked this and said this is a judicial coup made by the majority in order to grab power away and not give Israelis the protections in law they're entitled to. Reservist fighter pilots refused to attend a training exercise, this week joined by 650 members of the IDF Special Forces Command. This is uncharted territory for Israel. And you've got army general staff, senior military officials, who believe this is now imperiling the security of Israel. And you've always positioned yourself, I know this because you've told me yourself before, as Israel's Mr. Security. Well, let's, let's uh, again, if you'd allow me to answer the of question, course, I will. Course. Okay, so the first thing is, I think, balancing the uh, judicial, uh, the, having the judges not select themselves, which is what this bill is about, is not only, does not only uh, weaken democracy, it strengthens democracy, because in all other democracies, in all other democracies, with the exception of the UK, and there may be one more exception, the judges do not choose themselves, the elected officials do. And that's what this bill does, and I think it's right. On the other hand, there is one consideration that the critics and the opponents of this judicial reform uh, uh, raise, and I think it's a valid concern, and that is you want to go from one extreme to the center. You don't, you don't want the pendulum to swing to the other mm. side where the Knesset, our parliament, can nullify any decision of the Supreme Court. And I think that requires a balance. I agree with that. So it has to be in so the So you center. are going to rein back then on this current yes, proposal? Yes, yes. I, I said that. How that significantly? I, well, I said that there's not going to be uh, uh, this unlimited power. When you want to restrain unlimited power, you don't go and give the parliament unlimited power over the court. But that's what they say this current no, bill that, does. That, I explained very clearly that as far as I, I'm concerned, that will not happen. So I think you need to reach the the happy center. Now, the other thing is, look, I don't want the army, you know, look, I think a lot of people go to these uh, demonstrations. They're patriotic Israelis. They want the good of the country. But a lot of them don't actually know the details of the bills, just like the, what I just described. They don't even know that the leaders of the opposition that are now going to these demonstrations, they themselves argued that the court, the way we select judges, should be changed. They themselves did it before the election. So all these people protesting just don't get it. 
Many, many of them don't. Many of them... Isn't that slightly patronising, Prime Minister? No, to, I don't think to so. To tell your own people no. who are protesting in hundreds of thousands... I didn't thousands. say that all of them don't. But no, you lied it, don't. they just don't understand. Well, listen, you have to see the mainstream media in Israel that is going uh, on this uh, like a huge, huge, huge propaganda campaign. Well, the, ad the added complication for you is that you, of course, are still going through an ongoing trial that is suspended while you're Prime Minister for corruption and bribery. It's not suspended at all. It's going on all the time. So it's going on? It's going on. And in fact, it's unraveling. The charges, the, uh, uh, the, main, the charges that were uh, put before me were ridiculous. And they're just unraveling in the court. You're discovering things like prosecutorial uh, intimidation of witnesses, the blackmailing of witnesses, uh, changing, uh, uh, tampering with but, evidence. But here's the point. Uh, so all of that is coming out. And Brother, that you would be, agree. You would that agree. will be dealt with in the trial. The judges that are going to decide uh, th this case have already been selected. Mm. They will not be affected but by here's this the point, legal reform. Here's the point I was going to make, mm -hmm. is twofold. One, the Attorney General, uh, Ghali Baharov Miara, says you've broken the law by directly involving yourself in an overhaul of the judiciary when you're facing an ongoing corruption trial. She said it was illegal and tainted by a conflict of interest. That's completely false. Uh, I maintain the same uh, conflict of interest restraints and I'm abiding by every consideration that my case is not going to be affected by this legal reform one iota. But what happened but if it... to insist, I am the Prime Minister of Israel. Mm. Israel is going through the most acute crisis in many years. Uh, you yourself said how important it is mm. to say that the Prime Minister of Israel cannot deal with something to try to bring a resolution to this crisis, cannot speak about it, cannot try to resolve this issue, cannot take care of the security of the country, which you yourself say mm. may be, uh, may be uh, uh, impacted by this. Mm. This, is, this is absurd. If it, was a, if it was an opposition leader who was in power, who was going through a corruption and bribery trial, I don't think you'd have the same view. I think, you would, exactly say, the same I think view. you'd say there's a clear conflict no, of interest here. I'd, I'd say no, there isn't, because the trial or my legal proceedings are completely unaffected by the, this reform. So the Attorney General, I mean, if, if the statement is that you've broken the law, you're saying, as Prime Minister of Israel, the Attorney General's wrong about the law. Well, of course I'm saying it. I said it openly, and I'm, well, mm. it's not a question. We have a disagreement on that. And in fact, that's going to be brought up uh, uh, in court proceedings. Uh, I think it's wrong. I think I, as Prime Minister of Israel, have a responsibility to see if I can somehow bring a conclusion to this uh, impasse somehow bring a, a resolution so we have responsible judicial democratic reform and at the same time keep the country together. Who's going to do that if not the prime minister? Yeah, but your, your point is that the judiciary has got too much power. Yeah. Uh, but what you want to do, and this is again from your critics, and there are a lot of them, and I, again to repeat, they're not just people on the opposition. This is, you know, the voices across the, across the divide here on this. They say what you're pushing for is a form of autocratic rule, where the one remaining check and balance on your power as prime minister is just evaporated, and you ultimately can then determine judge selection, you can determine what laws you pass or don't pass. You become the overriding autocratic leader, as they have in many countries where there are genuine autocracies, of the kind that you talked about in 2012 now, in that speech. You keep repeating these... Uh these uh, shibboleths and these, uh, these absurdities. Uh, I made Israel the most liberal country, uh, um, among the most liberal countries on the planet. I liberalized its uh, economy, turned it from a straight uh, jacketed uh, socialist economy to a free market economy uh, that benefited the entire people. I uh, brought in uh, investments into the Arab sector more than all the previous governments combined. I, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, the leader of the gay cell in the Likud, my party, I nominated to be the Speaker of the Knesset, the third uh, highest uh, position in the country. And he was elected not because he's gay, he was elected because he's very good. Uh, but that's the liberal position that I've always espoused and espouse now. To try to paint me as some uh, third world autocrat is ridiculous. I believe in the balance. I'm a classic Democrat with a small d. I don't want to get into trouble with my American friends. 
but I'm, a, I'm a, a, a classic believer in the balance between the three branches of government. That's what ensures democracy, and it's been thrown off balance in Israel. We have to bring it back. It will not give any power. I do not select. What happens you know, when the I do not select the judges. In fact, they will be selected by, uh, by a, a composite committee. It's not important right now, but the majorities, minorities, they all have their place in there. So this is complete. False. But what propaganda. are the concessions you're going to make from the current bill to appease those who say what you're doing is taking it from one extreme pendulum in your the, eyes the most, to the another? The most important thing, the most important thing, is indeed to restrain the power of the parliament to uh, strike down any decisions that the Supreme Court makes. I think the Supreme Court deserves its place under the sun, its powers, but it just has to be. Uh, there are no checks and balances right now in Supreme Court power. So you want to get some checks and balances on that, but you don't want to eliminate checks and balances on the. Uh, on but the you parliament. want to stop the Supreme Court from interfering in any. No, 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 no. It's it's called uh, against basic laws, which form uh, the constitutional framework, mm. if you will. Uh, you don't have a not, constitution, do you? No. Well, the the Supreme Court argues that we do already. Mm. The uh, the founder, the uh, Supreme former Supreme Court president, said that the basic laws that have been enacted form a constitutional framework. So that those, in any case, those laws, in my opinion, have to be protected. Uh, the Supreme Court can't challenge them, but it can challenge other laws. And the question is, what is the majority that is required in the Supreme Court to strike down a law? That's I, I won't get into the, the right. weeds. But of what they're going to do, surely, the Supreme Court, they will try and strike down this. So what do you do as a prime minister that wants to do this if the Supreme Court exercises what it believes to be its right to strike down? Your bill. Well, I think that there's a. It's never happened before that the Supreme Court strikes down basic law. This is a basic law, and I don't think they're about to do it. And I, I hope really, they, they never had such a direct attack on their authority. It's not well. Then the question is, should they be able to uh, to, to judge that? To, to, you know, that's a question. Well, it seems that the people of Israel who are protesting every week and all these eminent people who are commenting about this, they prefer the current situation to one where the power moves to the prime well, minister. Well, it, it always it doesn't move to the prime minister. It's got nothing to do with it. The prime minister gets no. To power. politicians. Yeah. To, well, then you have to ask yourself, if that were the case, I don't see any democracy that has such extreme powers of the Supreme Court as in Israel. There's no such democracy. So, are they not democracies? Are they dictatorships? Of course not. They're perfect. When you are trying to take some power away from any branch of government, and in this case from the judiciary, they don't want to take it away. Right now, you have a situation where 15 unelected uh, members of the Supreme Court effectively govern Israel. They can decide things that affect our military, our economy, our foreign relations, our battle with terrorism. Is that right? Is that democratic? No, it's not democratic. You want to correct it. Israel is democratic in the sense that you vote for a government, but when you vote for a government, you want that government to govern. Right now, the powers of that government to govern are severely restricted by a Supreme Court that has more powers than any other in any other democracy on earth. You don't say that those other democracies are somehow tainted, are somehow not democratic because they've uh, they have a better balance of power. And trying to balance it is difficult. I grant you that. You can see how difficult it is. Right. I don't deny it, and I understand the concerns of those who are generally generally worried about the, the future of Israel. But so am I. And I would not let Israel become less democratic. I want it to be more democratic. But you've always been a politician, it strikes me, who's got an instinct for what the people are thinking. You must be aware the scale of this is like nothing you've ever had to deal with in any of your terms of office, any Israeli prime minister. Mm -hmm. you, this is unprecedented for you. And there comes a point when if you're just going to keep pushing up against this gigantic, ever-growing hill of opposition, including you know, members of your own government, who said they should, you should stop this and negotiate. What is your response to that? Well, you know, I was the first one to call for negotiations, even, even though I was in a curious position, because they told me you can't deal with the, the actual uh, workings of the bill, so I didn't. I actually didn't. But I did call on the opposition to join the coalition, the government, to discuss uh, reaching some kind of compromise. And I've called for three months, and they haven't come. So you ask yourself, and when they say, let's halt it, I say, well, you just wasted three months. Why don't you come in and talk? Get into the room, start say, saying what your concerns are, like the ones you raised here. Mm -hmm. we'll, uh, uh, our people will give their responses. We can, uh, I, I think we can figure out uh, a middle way that will be, I, I think, successful. By the way, I still hope that will happen. Remember that the bill that is now in, in Parliament, as we speak, is, uh, is, is one component, just one component. 
It really deals only with the selection of... But you know how big this is blown. You went to see yeah. Rishi Sunak, British Prime Minister, yesterday. And in their readout of your meeting, it spoke about the desire to save Israeli democracy. Curiously, in yours, I'll read the exact word, it said the importance of upholding the democratic values that underpin our relationship, including in the proposed judicial reforms in Israel. But in, in the statement from your office, it didn't mention that. Why? Well, because we spoke for about an hour and uh, the, the, the Prime Minister indeed raised that issue, the Prime Minister Rishi. It was, uh, there's a debate in, in, my, in my team whether it was 45 seconds or 47 seconds out of the hour. So, yes, he did raise it. You're quite right. I don't deny it. But uh, I think it's sort of, it's become a perfunctory thing. You sort of have to say it because people are pressing. There are BDS people that are pressing it. They're, uh, you know, it's become a political uh, hot potato in Israel. So. Uh, the, the, the opponents have their supporters here, and they're pressing on the various governments. I understand that. And look, people don't necessarily get into the details of it, but I do. Uh, and but the American president has also said the same thing, yes. Joe Biden. Yes. He's yes. also said, said that to you. Yeah, sure. I spoke to him uh, the other day on the phone. But and spoke, what did he say to you? Well, first of all, we spoke about Iran, as you can Of course, imagine. and I'll come to that. And, and uh, a lot. Mm. <laughs> and... Uh, but he raised that, and I assured him what I assured you, that Israel was, will, and is, and will remain a democracy. It's a worrying time for Israel with America, because for the first time in polling history, a majority of Democrats in America now have more sympathy for Palestinians than they do for Israelis. There's been an 11-point swing in the last year alone. That must concern you, and what also must concern you, more people aged 18 to 29 now view more sympathy with Palestinians than they do Israelis. What's your response to that? Well, I've, uh, I think uh, I've looked at other polls, uh, but you can never uh, you can never deny that the, the the alliance between Israel and America is takes the majority of Americans uh, to support Israel, and they do. They do consistently. But that's got to concern you, hasn't it? That poll. Uh, you know, you look at it and you say one thing. Uh, you know, America is changing not vis-a-vis -vis Israel. America is changing vis-a-vis -vis America. But one of the reasons and people you've often said that. Well, yeah, yeah yes. but America is changing vis-a-vis -vis, um, America, and therefore it changes vis-a-vis -vis Israel. But I think the main bulk of American, uh, the American public, uh, by the way, across the political spectrum, a wide, wide uh, berth of the political spectrum, support Israel because they see Israel as yeah, but not, representing, not, not representing the, the values. Right, but not Democrat supporters and um, nor the young ones, 18 to 29. Well, there's, there, there's a question of where that goes and whether this pendulum doesn't swing back, you know. One of the reasons is they, they cite a lot of them, apparently, your very close relationship with Donald Trump. They think that you really pivoted to him. You described him as the greatest friend Israel's ever had in the White House. I said Israel had no greater friend in the White House. That's true, mm. because he did some very good things. He moved the embassy to Jerusalem, recognized Jerusalem as our capital, recognized our sovereignty in the Golan Heights, and went out of this disastrous uh, the Iran deal, nuclear deal that would have paved Iran's path with gold to nuclear weapons. So yes, I appreciate it. But I, uh, I always approach American presidents, whether it's uh, Did you take Donald sides Trump. too much with Trump? Not at all. I never took sides. Did you align anyone. yourself too much? I didn't align myself with anyone. I didn't come in as a, as a Republican or a, a Democrat. I came in as an Israeli. And uh, I have uh, close friends uh, among uh, both sides of the aisle. Joe Biden, with whom I often disagree. Mm -hmm. By the way, I somehow disagreed with Trump, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to tell him we should go to... Well, he wasn't the, happy when you, the, when you the, tweeted your... Congratulations to President well, Biden on winning maybe, the election. Maybe not, but what I want Well, he was to say extremely, if you don't mind me, I don't want to use a, a, a profanity in front of you, but he, uh, he was heard on tape saying that it was uh, the ultimate betrayal. He hadn't spoken to you since, and bleep him, he said about you. He then added, Bibi is Bibi. Bibi didn't want to make peace, never did. Right, well, I did, actually. Uh, with his help, we made uh, a breakthrough of peace, the Abraham Accords with four Arab states. It's a turning point in history. And if I came back, it's to do two things. Came back into office because, as you know, it's not uh, walking in a rose garden uh, to be the Prime Minister of Israel uh, at any time, and especially this time. The reason I came back is to do two things. One, block Iran, Iran's quest for nuclear weapons that aims to destroy my country and threaten every other country. And the second thing is to expand the historic uh, Abraham Accords, the peace accords, which uh, and end the Arab-Israeli conflict. And I believe uh, that I can do both. And that's what I'm here for. Uh, but look, I've dealt with presidents. Have you spoken we, to Donald Trump since, since then? He wrote me a note. Uh, what did he say? He congratulated me on my victory. Did he? Yeah. 
So have you made peace? Have you spoken on the phone? I, I, I didn't, never, never made war. I mean, he I might be back in the White House. I've you? always, I, look, I have to tell you, I, I have, Joe Biden has been a personal friend for over 40 years, uh, and I've disagreed with him. Donald Trump has been a, a great friend, and I've often disagreed with him. Uh, not often, but sometimes. And the same happened with other American uh, presidents. I represent the people of Israel, a people who for 3,000 years, actually 3,500 years, is trying to survive and revive itself in our ancient homeland, and we did. It doesn't go without problems, as you can see. It doesn't go without debate. Israel is fiercely democratic, fierce debates. Uh, but I believe that we have, that my mission is to assure that Israel is sufficiently strong militarily, economically, diplomatically, to defend itself against the likes of Iran. How did you feel to, when- They want to wipe us off the planet. I'm gonna to come to Iran in one moment. How did you feel about Donald Trump having dinner with Kanye West? and the white supremacist Nick Fuentes, two, that was horrible. two people who'd spewed a lot of anti-Semitic I thought stuff. it was horrible and I said so. I think it's a big mistake. It's wrong. It's wrong from every point of view. How damaging is it when someone with Kanye West's following suddenly seems to go rogue anti-Semitic in the way that he did? My father was a great historian and a historian of anti-Semitism and goes back about 2,500 years as a sort of a doctrine that keeps changing. Uh, but basically people say there's trouble in the world, I want to blame the Jews. We have a setback here or a setback there, blame the Jews. The communists say the Jews are the capitalists, the capitalists say the Jews are the communists, blame the Jews. So, you know, that's a, a deep-seated pattern. It should not be uh, continence, it should not be accepted, it should be rebuked and condemned, and that's what I do. And I don't care, I don't care where it comes from uh, or from whom. Let's talk about Ukraine uh, briefly, if we may. Uh, I interviewed Governor Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor, a few days ago, and he said that Vladimir Putin is a war criminal and should be held account for his crimes. Do you share that view? Well, I think that uh, I share the view that Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine war is a horrible, horrible uh, tragedy, that it should be, if I can do anything to help stop it, I will. And I'll, I'll refrain from saying more because I might be in a position, might be in a position to help stop it one day. And have I you been asked, to, I know you were asked at the start to try and mediate perhaps, have you been asked again? I haven't been asked officially, but I received unofficial approaches from, uh, supposedly from both sides, I don't want to say more than that. At the time I wasn't the prime minister, I said there's one prime minister at the time and I'm not gonna jump in and if the opportunity uh, arises where there's a realistic chance that I can help stop this tragedy, this horror, horror, there's no other word, uh, then I'll do it. But it wasn't a legal invasion, wasn't it? I mean, it, it, it broke every international no, law. No, it's not the question. The question is, where is the, uh, you know, what is it that you can do uh, to, to stop this uh, horror? Uh, and, you know, as, as long as there's a glimmer of a chance that I can, I'll, I'll keep that glimmer alive. Iran now can enrich uranium to 84% purity, which clearly is a dangerous situation, not least for Israel. Um, they might see what they perceive to be from what they've read and heard, an unchecked Israel government packed with what many people view as extremists as a, <laughs> clear, well, as a, threat, as a threat to them. So, okay. well, let me just put that to you, because people well, have said that. Okay, well, they say a lot of Silly things. I mean, this is silly. Israel is a... No, this has come from Israelis who fear that that may send the wrong message to Iran. Well, I, I think that's nonsense. I mean, uh, I think all Israelis are united in uh, seeing the danger of a nuclear Iran. All Israelis understand that, at least I understand, that it's my responsibility as the leader of the one and only Jewish state, which Iran calls for its annihilation, to do everything in our power to stop it. Uh, and Iran should know that I... Uh, and Israel will do everything we can to stop it. It's got nothing to do with the composition of the government. It's got everything to do with the composition of our history and the fact that they're calling for our destruction. Rishi Sunak uh, said again in the readout from your meeting, our governments will continue to work closely together to push back against aggression from Iran and manage the risk of nuclear proliferation. But in reality, what can someone like Rishi Sunak on behalf of Britain do? to help you in this situation? I think, first of all, it's important to say it. I think it's important also to apply economic pressures. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the combination of crippling economic uh, sanctions and a credible military threat uh, can hold back Iran's uh, nuclear ambitions. I don't think 
without a, new, a credible military threat, you're not going to stop Iran, just as you, the only thing that stopped Saddam Hussein was a credible military action on our part. The only thing that stopped uh, uh, Syria, Hafez uh, uh, Assad, or rather uh, Bashar Assad from developing nuclear weapons is a credible military action on our part. Gaddafi feared a credible military action on the part of the U.S., so he gave up his nuclear weapons. North Korea didn't. So it has now nuclear weapons that can uh, cover uh, half of Asia and then very soon perhaps the United States. Iran is 50 times more dangerous than North Korea and we must do everything and I must do everything to prevent it from having nuclear weapons. What is required from the international community? Sanctions, strong sanctions from the United States and from Israel, a credible military threat. Final question, Prime Minister. There have been 88 Palestinians and 15 Israelis killed so far this year. It's the highest rate of deaths in two decades. Many are saying that a lot of this is down to incendiary rhetoric from some of your right-wing uh, members of your government. And they particularly uh, cite uh, Bezalel Smotrich, who, who earlier had called for the segregation of maternity wards so Arab and Jewish newborns would be separated at birth. He's now in charge of the civil administration of the Occupy West Bank. Last week, he said, who was the first Palestinian king? What language do the Palestinians have? Was there ever a Palestinian currency? Is there a Palestinian history or culture? Nothing. There is no such thing as a Palestinian people. That's not helpful to anything, is it? Uh, I think that there are a lot of statements that he made previously that he um, uh, uh, walked away from. Uh, and some he said were, were not accurate. I, in any case, uh, they're part of my government, but they're part of my government, and I... Uh, I decide policy. That but do you could, distance could, yourself from comments like that? Uh, there are more, many comments. When, that, when he that called for the Palestinian town of Awara to be wiped of course, out? Of course not. Uh, of course I, that's totally unacceptable. And he should said, someone like him he be... Corrected, he should corrected... Some, right, but should somebody, but wait, wait a minute, be fair to him. Uh, about, I don't know if it was 20 minutes later or uh, mm. 30 minutes later or whatever, or a few hours later, he said, I was misunderstood. That's not what I meant. We don't believe, he doesn't believe it, by the way, I know him, uh, got to work with him now a few months. We don't believe in collective punishment. I go after the terrorists, I go after those who support the terrorists, but I don't believe in collective punishment. I also think that you, you should know that the, the rise of Palestinian terrorism and as a consequence of the, the fatalities that you're talking about actually happened in the previous government. It doubled the number of uh, shooting incidents, drive downs, and other things that uh, are involved in terrorism came from the Palestinian side. And the weakness that we have here is the weakness of the Palestinian Authority that doesn't send its security forces to stop the terrorists, and therefore we have to do it. And what we are trying to do right now is calm things down, put a, if you will, a, uh, put some kind of mechanism in place that we're trying to do with the Palestinian Authority and with others to stop the violence but or at least reduce of, yeah, it. Yeah, but members of your government saying stuff like that is unbelievably incendiary. Well, that comment on that village is absolutely right, and he walked away from it very quickly. But his uh, comment, but, but, but his comment saying there's no such thing as Palestinian well, people. Well, he has that view. Uh, I think, do you have that view? No, I think I think there wasn't a Palestinian people in the 19th century. Clearly, do you but, think there's a Palestinian people now? I think it galvanized their national consciousness, galvanized in the 20th century, and the question is, will it hold mm. uh, or into the future? That's something that has to be seen. Uh, but I, I think they're there. They're they're definitely. You know, living among us, and we have to live among them. The problem we have with them is that they say, "You're not going to live among us." The problem, the, the reason this conflict persists now for a hundred years, is because the Palestinians, led by uh, irresponsible leaders, are resolutely opposed to a Jewish state in any boundary. So it doesn't make it. No one succeeded. Previous governments, very left-wing governments, generous governments, you know, unbelievably concessionary governments. They gave everything. Nothing helped because they are not interested in a territorial uh, resolution. They're interested in the dissolution of the one and only Jewish state. But so, far this year, but so far this year, six times as many Palestinians have died as Israelis. That's just a fact. Well, do you want to compare what happened in uh, other conflicts? No, I'm just saying this year. You want to, com you want to compare other conflicts, uh, include global no, conflicts? No, I'm, I'm saying this year. Yeah, well, because what happens is that they start shooting uh, Israelis. 
Uh, they have, uh, we go after the terrorists. The terrorists uh, hide inside terrorist strongholds, and to get to them, we have to fight other terrorists. Most of them, by the way, are uh, combatants, that is, terrorists who are, who have been hit. But in the crossfire that is there, I wouldn't judge the justice of a battle by the number of casualties on either side, because you'd be in very, very shaky historical ground, uh, and you know that very well. I know you've uh, got to go to get a plane. Uh, yes. You're on TikTok. I'm on TikTok. Yeah. A lot of calls now for people to ban TikTok. What's your view for Israel, and will you come off it? I don't know. I haven't looked into it. Uh, Are you a TikToker? I mean, do you do yeah, it? I occasionally like use it. Yeah, sure. I, <laughs> You're not worried about the Chinese? Well, harvesting data for you and uh, all the Israelis who use TikTok? Well, I'll tell you what, since you raise it, I'll look into it. Thank you, Prime Minister. Good Thank to you. see you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Bye -bye.